Hello and good afternoon. This is Matthias Quack speaking, your host at this Trace One webinar that we are seeing this afternoon together with LSAT Retalytics co-hosted. We will have some 45 minutes to go in this webinar, which is titled The Future is Sustainable or Is It? We are trying to follow a holistic approach uh, to uh, what is sustainable and what is not sustainable, sustainable in the retail industry. With us, we have uh, Denise Klug, who is a director of product at LSAT Retailytics. Good afternoon. And Christophe Vanacker, chief executive officer of Trace One. Good afternoon. So, uh, something about these two uh, presenters today. Christoph is a passionate people, customer, and growth focused leader. As the CEO of Trace One, Christoph is responsible for driving Trace One's vision and strategy across all functions and develop the performance culture with the aim to reinforce Trace One leadership. He has more than 25 years of solid experience in global business management. He has been living in Austria, UK, Germany, and Turkey. He joined Trace One in 2016. Denise from Elsad Retalytics, she's the head of our international analyst team and works closely with our developers on the IT of our database. In addition to that, she gets very excited about anything that has to do with private label trends and loves to deliver projects with this specific top topic, as we will see today. So about uh, Retalytics. Retalytics helps you to identify the hidden growth opportunities in the European grocery market. Our senior analysts highlight and benchmark key developments, facts, and figures. Trace One was founded in 2001 and it powers the largest platform for the development of consumer packaged goods with more than 20,000 companies in 100 countries, developing over $300 billion in products annually. We help retailers and FMCG companies to create and evolve unique, healthy and responsible products to market them fast. Enough for that, for that from my side, so I'm now handing over to Denise for her presentation. Thank you, Matthias. Um, yeah, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In my part of the presentation, I'm going to discuss um, the topic, the future is sustainable. Um, for this, uh, this is going to be our agenda. So first of all, I'm going to set the scene, then discuss how this translates into product trends, talk about the fact that we are not talking about a niche, then I would like to highlight Sustainability 2.0, the holistic edition, as I call it. Then uh, we come to an outlook where I uh, will give you some ideas on what I see could be the future of sustainability. And in the end, I'm going to provide you with some implications for retailers and manufacturers in particular. So now um, let's set the scene. There is a climate crisis. This probably doesn't hit you by surprise because most of you have already noticed that. It's something that has been going on for decades, some things even for centuries. So it's a common scenario, but there's something new that has started in 2018. So it has been only one year when, um, only one year ago, when Greta Thunberg decided to go on a climate strike and not attend school. It's one girl and she influenced a protest, which is a worldwide happening, a worldwide protest on Fridays amongst students and pupils that um, go on a school strike and protest for a climate um, improvement, for a better situation, for politicians to take action. You can also see here a sign that says, my name is also Greta, so they highly identify with her. What's particularly of interest for this um, specific audience that we have here for the industry of retailers and manufacturers is that these demands 
they have clearly include overall consumption habits. So we do not only talk about um, some politicians that have to take action, but also about consumers, as you can see here in the sign saying environmentalists don't eat animals or we can't achieve environmental justice without animal liberation. You can't buy back a life, go vegan. This is something you can find on the signs of many, many people that take part in these protests. At the same time, they also criticize packaging and manufacturing processes. So um, here's a sign saying nothing lasts forever except plastic. And in, on the sign on the right hand side, you can see a plastic bag saying you shouldn't use it. So how does this, what we've just seen, translate into product trends? Whenever I check news on retailers and manufacturers, I find plenty of articles on who is reducing packaging in uh, both industries. So here you can see an example from Lidl that reduced the plastic for this next level burger patties and also decided to buy climate certificates to get um, climate neutral. This is Carlsberg launching paper bottles. Coca-Cola working with recyclable bottles here. L'Oreal, paper packaging. Frosta, even for frozen food, 100% paper packaging. Rewe, reducing plastic for their private label mushrooms. And Lavazza, launching a biodegradable um, coffee cup here. In addition to these trends in the packaging industry that we are probably going to see in the next couple of months and even years accelerating, we can only see that there are many, many new trendy private labels in terms of, and, and products in terms of the vegan and vegetarian assortment. The difference from these products to the ones that we've known so far is that they particularly not target hardcore vegans anymore. So, of course, uh, vegans feel attracted by these products, but they are not the main target group. On the left hand side, you can see one of the latest private label launches from Tesco in the UK, which is called Wicked Kitchen. If you have a close look, you can see that there is no vegan label on the packaging. It's a manufacturer. Um, the manufacturer is a chef that gives the idea of that and um, they work together with Tesco to bring these products on the shelves. And they experiment a lot with trendy ingredients. Uh, we see new launches all the time of these range, so it's extended a lot. In the center, you can see um, truck store chain DM's Bio yogurt. It's a cashew yogurt. And the reason behind that is the fact that the truck store operator does not offer chiller cabinets in their stores. So at some highly frequented locations, they have small fridges with some water bottles in them. And in this case, they developed a yogurt with cashew. Um, so it's only cashew as a yogurt. And um, it has been um, heated in an attempt to make it a durable product that they can put on the regular shelves. So this cashew yogurt variety does not require them to cool the product, to chill it. On the right hand side, I also decided to talk about this Whopper. It's a new Rebel Whopper from Burger King that was recently rolled out in Europe. It says 100% Whopper, 0% beef. And um, in fact, the burger patty is really a vegan patty delivered by Unilever's recently acquired um, vegetarian slaughter. So it's a vegan patty, but Burger King insists on putting mayonnaise with eggs on these burgers. And in addition to that, they also insist on putting these patties on the same grill where they prepare the meat patties. They say it's important for the taste that they use their very professional here, which means many, many vegans don't like this fact, 
and they uh, won't feel attracted by this whopper. But it appears the Burger King simply doesn't care because they're not after these kind of target group. They're more after flexitarians and people that really try to approach an environmentally friendly um, diet. And we see more and more of this kind of shopper clientele. I would like to remain in the burger segment because uh, in terms of patties, there's a lot going on in Europe at the moment. And this was particularly influenced by the fact that Beyond Meat rolled out their innovative patties um, in the European market. So uh, for those of you that have not come across this brand, it's from the US and it's based on pea protein. And um, thanks to ingredients like beetroot, it um, really has the taste and feel of a meat burger or meat patty. What you can also see in the picture is the fact that Beyond Meat is positioned next to meat products. This is something they tell all the retailers where they uh, want to get a listing. We want to be positioned next to the meat products, not in the vegan or vegetarian corner in the stores. Thing is that they really look for people that want to find an alternative to meat products. This is the target group of Beyond Meat. And the same applies to the increasing number of copycat products. Um, here I put some examples on the slide. You can also see that um, the discounters are really the forerunners in that segment. And um, what I found particularly interesting for the private label versions of the discounters is that they are really produced in the markets where they sold, which means the discounters have strong cooperations with their um, suppliers of the meat products, and then they approach them to get a vegan product like that. So you can see here a Lidl burger patty from Ireland that's available in the Irish discount stores of the chain. For Aldi, the same applies to the UK burgers. And um, also for Aldi Germany and Lidl Germany, you will find um, patties from German manufacturers in the German on the German shelves. So you've seen that the discounters really play an important role in this entire scenario. And um, I would like to highlight that we're not only talking about a niche here. This is how leaflets currently look like, just regular discounter leaflets. They are green because they promote their organic private labels virtually everywhere. They have new cooperations and um, extend their private label um, organic clients, list new organic products, brands as well. This is one of the latest leaflets of Lidl and I find it particularly interesting that they again show some drops in figures, but this time it's not prices that drop, but um, the amount of plastic that you, that's used for the packaging. Lidl is present in 28 European markets and Aldi is present in 16 European markets. This is a ranking of the top 10 retailers in Europe by retail sales. The blue bars are for the 2019 sales figure, and the gray ones are for 2024. And you can see here, Schwarzkrupp, uh, the parent of Lidl, leads a pack followed by Aldi. And for Schwarzkrupp, 75% of the sales um, are generated by the Lidl operation. Discounters are massive, and whenever they find a strategy being successful, they roll it out across their entire European network. And currently, they really have a focus on sustainability, organic, vegan diets, and all these kind of things. So now I would like to discuss some very hot trends in the sustain sustainability segment. 
the sophistic cons uh, sophisticated consumers really want to know what's going on and they ask questions. They do not only want to see what's on the shelves, they want to know the background story. They want to know if there's palm oil in the product. They want to know if it's regional, where it's sourced, is it organic? Um, how do the companies treat the workers? And all these kind of aspects, they ask questions, active questions, and they really like companies that answer them. So one of the pioneers in doing that and embracing blockchain as a tool here for traceability and, and transparency is Tony's um, producer of chocolate. And um, they also produce the private label for Albert Hein, which you can see here also in the picture. It's the blue bar. And all of them have this logo, which means uh, we work together to make our chocolate 100% slavery free. So via blockchain, they guarantee that they don't um, have any slavery in the supply chain. Another great example that I've recently come across is this soup. Um, Oma's soup is produced by young and elderly women sitting together, cutting leftover vegetables to create a convenience product. So it's a thing about a two generations working together, meeting each other, and um, also it helps to reduce food waste because the products are close to expiration date. So now we've spoken a lot about sustainability and trends, but I would like to also share a very cynical approach here now, which is, wouldn't be um, the most sustainable and ethical consumption to consume as least as possible. So consumption in itself, of course, means that you need to consume a product and um, this has an impact on the environment and everything. But this is not really what, what I've just said. It's not something like a communist theory that I would like to share with you. It's more than that. So here I put a meme on that slide. Um, memes are uh, little pictures with text that are shared via social media. So in this case, um, so in this case, they decided to focus on the topic um, ethical consumption. So it's a meme saying ethical consumptions under late capitalism is something I've never seen in my life. Next to a dragon, a T-Rex and a unicorn, which showcases this is something that has reached um, the pop culture. Young people, it's something they talk about. And um, we can also see that some of the shopping habits have changed. We can see a rise of second-hand stores, H&M, um, selling um, second-hand clothes and so does um, Urban Outfitters. And um, this could have an effect on overall willingness to consume, but it also means that simply new impulses are needed to attract these people. It can be that some of the retailers and manufacturers have found a loophole here. So here would like to share some really um, nice examples on that. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see share, which describes what they do themselves as social consumption. The products they sell um, always include a donation. So whenever you buy a product, they will donate an equivalent product to poor people. In the center, you can see um, a product from Lidl because whenever there's a trend, of course, Lidl jumps on the bandwagon. This is uh, a water that you can buy at Lidl and 10 cents of that, of these 0 0.5 liter packs, is donated to SOS Children's Villages. They have the hashtag Little Cares for this. And on the right hand side, you can see Morrison's ready meals for children um, of the private label Little Kitchen. 
and they have all been taste tested by a group of kids from cancer charity Click Sargent. And the retailer also said that they want to donate 300,000 British pounds of the sales to this partner. I've recently been on vacation and I found another nice example of that trend. Um, yeah, I, I went to the Black Forest and there's the Edeka Division Südwest. I found a very nice and I would even say very German product. You can buy a Bockwurst, so uh, a red sausage, and at the same time support the fire brigade because they donate money to that, which means you can consume something and at the same time donate something. It does not mean that you consume just for the sake of consumption, but also do something good with that. On the right hand side, you can see the brand equivalent uh, from Austria, Tomato Ketchup Felix, that also supports the fire brigade. So uh, what are the implications of what I've just shown you? The time is ripe for new ventures in the field of sustainability. It's a great time to come up with new ideas and things like that. Um, the aggressive giants Lidl and Aldi are on the forefront of innovation. This means that they excel on an international level in an area that used to be one of the USPs of the full range players like supermarkets. Others have already started to copy their approach to ensure they do not fall too far behind the Northfields competition. Well, it would be a smarter plan actually to push the differentiation to a more granular level. There are plenty of small innovative manufacturers with fresh green ideas just waiting to be discovered. And yeah, it is really now the best time to approach retailers with sustainable product ideas. Small and medium sized companies must dare to be different, try out something new and speak about it because the product's added value needs to be communicated clearly and on as many platforms as possible. Good ideas could see a permanent place on market shelves as the current wave of sustainability has become the recipe for the future. So, um, of course, not everybody is a Greta. But changing the personal shopping habits, decisions, already helps to ease the conscience and make people feel less passive. And here on the slide, I added also uh, another product that donates um, part of the profits or uh, actually all of the profits they want to generate to charity. It's called I'm a toilet paper. And when you buy this toilet paper, uh, yeah, they donate the profit to help build toilet papers in other countries. So um, this was my part of the presentation. And um, now I would like to... Yeah, let's hand it over to Christoph. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. So in, uh, in continuation of the uh, of Dennis' presentation, let, let me ding a little bit on uh, brand owners and their necessity to adapt uh, to the upcoming challenges, which are, of course, the sustainability and, and the wish to see the consumer uh, uh, best served, according to, uh, I would say, very uh, fluctuating uh, changes. So on, on the first slide, um, I'm, I'm doing a kind of uh, focus on, uh, on the private label, where we see that there is a a clear rise and growth of that market. And if we look, for example, at Europe today, uh, the private label industry has reached again a record level uh, last year. In 17 countries, private label brands account today for 30% of the market of the market, and sometimes it's a bit more. If we look at Spain, Switzerland, and the UK, that it's over 50%. And if we look at Germany, the market share is 44% for the third consecutive year. So even if we, when we go to uh, North America today, we see that private brands is growing by 4%. Uh, 
which is something like six, six or seven percent higher than national brands. So we see here that there is a clear trend from the retailer to uh, to focus and to put some efforts on the on the private brands due to the fact that they just better control uh, the whole product chain from the ideation, I would say, up to uh, up to the delivery. We, we see also customer trends being taken into account more and more. Uh, as it was said previously, the people want to, to live healthier uh, and use more responsible products. Uh, we see that the brands must be active and influencing to engage constructive changes for a better world, which is a uh, which is a, a words which we see on a very regular basis. We see private label retailers are developing their range as premium ranges, but also investing massively in organic products and with the continuous aim to uh, communicating on brand values, enhancing customer loyalty and providing a more affordable offering. We, we just saw recently in France, for example, that Intermarché has begun to review more than 900 products recipes to improve their nutri score. They just wanted to be better seen uh, by the consumers uh, and improve their score, which would of course uh, be closer to what the consumer is asking for. Another example in the UK with Tesco who just launched uh, a new plant-based product range and the, the, plant, the plant chef range aims to respond to a demand for vegetarian and vegan food products. And that's, that's a very big focus of Tesco these days. If we move to the US, for example, we have Walmart who wants to make uh, all its brand 100% recyclable, compostable and reusable by 2025. So we see here that uh, there is a big focus put on the private brands with uh, ambitious uh, targets and uh, means of course and investments that they put uh, to really challenge and uh, and be closer to the consumer. Uh, of course, their impact is much bigger than on national brands, and that's one of the big reasons why they are going on that. Of course, the priorities are, are shifting. We see private label strategy. It's not just uh, an afterthought. It's uh, it's in the main ring for many retailers. The strategies will will vary among retailers, obviously, but the mega trend shows that. Uh, there is a big, uh, a big investment in that direction and uh, it continues. It started already a couple of years ago and we see that it accelerates. So retailers will develop and market their own products rather than multinational name brands to meet the changing consumer needs. And what we hear more and more on, uh, on the web and from uh, uh, the head of these large retailers and brand owners is that uh, of course, they are, they are willing to invest more in that direction, also to change the way uh, retailers and brands are seen. Uh, they also want to be able to commit on, on what is inside the package. Uh, and they say, I'm happy to commit on the fact that I know that everything which is in the product is controlled by myself. And of course, I cannot guarantee that for, for the national brands. Um, all these facts show that the value of private label, but also the value of end-to-end -end supply chain managed by distributors, who are also previously simply purchaser, but who are now becoming the actual manufacturers. So that's, that's also a big change in the life of, of, of retailers and also for industrial people or suppliers, because they see that in some parts they are doing the same job, uh, sometimes for the same target. The consumer pressure for better product information is increasing. We see that uh, more than 50% of consumers are making purchasing decisions based on the origin of the product, uh, the ingredients, the uh, nutritional composition, uh, and also I think 20% of consumers consider that the environmental matter uh, impact on the product is becoming more, more, more important. So retailers and brand owners in general need to take in consideration all consumer experience expected. Uh, otherwise, they would see their, their sales performance uh, just coming down. And that's something which they are monitoring very closely. On the next slide, I'm, I'm getting into uh, on the consumer side. And uh, we see that the consumer are, are, are changing a lot. They are taking a big part of the uh, of the decision today 
Uh, we see that the consumer is really at the heart of the retail business evolution. Uh, the buying experience has completely changed over the last couple of years, and it's, it's, it's changing still every second day. Uh, it keeps on willing to access healthier, more responsible products. He wants to have it much quicker and everywhere, uh, and, and have an, a, a very quick view of the content. What's the composition? What's the origin? What's the provenance? So that they feel reassured that when they buy, they know what they buy. They need to have the, the, the choice. And if they decide to go for something which is very local, they, they want to be sure that they can have this decision at a, at a glance. So at the same time, consumers can be very well informed and are very well informed today. Uh, they also can share many information with others. There are a lot of communities which are, which are growing and which are getting more and more powerful today uh, about the product or, uh, or the brands. And this goes through, uh, of course, viral through uh, social media. So with the overall digital transformation, it's the consumer who creates the trends clearly today. And we see that uh, everyone is looking at uh, information coming from the consumers to make sure they are as close as possible. Nothing is decided backstage today and then uh, shipped to the market without being uh, tested, uh, checked and validated by, by consumers. So the, we can say that the consumer has moved from a passive status to a co-creator of the values. So clearly we are moving towards to a need to consume products that are both uh, healthier and more responsible. That's everywhere in all the possible media. The consumers are more attentive to nutritional quality and can, for example, compare the quality with a system like the Nutri-Score, which is getting more and more implemented by more and more uh, retailers today. And it becomes a kind of norm which helps consumer to decide how they want to consume. Uh, and consumers are more aware also of the environment uh, improvements um, that translate into more attention to packaging. And we see a lot of uh, focus today on uh, how to reduce the plastic as a global trend. But uh, we also look at uh, getting rid of the unnecessary packaging or making sure at least that it can be recycled. And, uh, and, and this is for the environment part, which is uh, very much linking to, uh, to, to the crisis that we, we environmental crisis that we mentioned before. Consumers want to more information and transparency about the product they buy and consume. Uh, and again, uh, the nutrition values and the ingredients are getting also very key, uh, not only the recipe and not only the taste. So we see that uh, also they are expecting strong and visible uh, societal uh, action and impacts from the brands uh, on the health, on the CSR, on the environment in, global, in, in general. That, that becomes something which is also uh, critical in the, in the consumption decision. Also, we see that uh, from the trends, the, uh, the, the revolution for tomorrow is clearly oriented on the uh, hyper-personalization. The consumer expects a high level of personalization that goes beyond the omni-channel uh, and having his name on the label. So soon we will see that uh, the consumer will choose to buy a brand and a product that will be able to offer him nearly tailor-made, adapted to his needs, his lifestyle, his passions, his aspirations, and also his health to an extent. And uh, we can already see that there are some applications on mobile phones which, where you can put your, 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 your physical uh, situation today uh, and, and avoid uh, to buy any kind of products which are containing uh, A, B, C ingredients because they're not good for your health. And um, that's the reason why we see it going to, uh, to, that, uh, to that depth. Um, on the next slide, I, I'll try to cover what's the impact uh, for, for the brand owners, because of course they are, they are they're having more and more challenges which are changing on a regular basis. Uh, the consumer are more and more informed, they're also volatile, they want to go uh, uh, on shopping at any kind of different uh, ways, uh, they want shorter time to market, more complex sourcing, the product development processes are getting more and more complex also. And, uh, and of course, uh, it, it 
could put some tension between the brand owners and their suppliers because uh, everybody wants to go faster and to be the first in the market so that the, uh, the retail uh, sales performance is growing. So it's forcing producers and distributors to innovate more and more uh, at the same time, but also to, to better inform and, and then transform themselves in, in the same time. Uh, and the change management in that those companies today is probably the, the biggest uh, focus and, uh, and challenge that, that, uh, that they are facing. So, so there is a need for more effective collaboration, definitely, between all the stakeholders of the ecosystem, which is becoming uh, very digital. Uh, so internally, the quality manager the, the, and the buyer partnership becomes uh, a reactor core, as we as we could say, and together they research new suppliers and new type of packaging, as well as the nutrition, environment considerations, and regulatory compliance. The purchasing, quality control, and CSR need to work closely together in the transversal mode to develop ranges that respond to consumer trends, and at the same time as maintaining an accessible price, as uh, which are the factors which are fundamental. Uh, and unique to the private label. Uh, we see that it's getting more and more premium, but uh, let's remember that uh, private label was also more uh, a commodity uh, uh, target at the beginning, and it has to cover the whole scope of the consumer still today. And externally, the brand owner and suppliers need to be more responsive, definitely. They need to share information, anticipate risks, propose innovation products, and adapt, of course, their processes faster. That's why the centralized management of product data from sourcing to specification to gain real-time visibility has become a real key. That, that, that shows an evident uh, development, which is the, uh, the growth of the, of the data. There are more and more information to share. We see that from one product, we can have uh, a lot of different uh, type of products which are coming from one from one and that generates of course lots of data which needs to be uh, accessible so so brand owners meaning the national or the private label must manage more complex data and share the data with its suppliers thus there is a fundamental need to centralize data but also to integrate the system with this data through the, the product development process and the buyers are today are tasked to, to uh, with selecting product assortment uh, to meet the current and future needs of the consumer. Uh, sometimes uh, many, many months before uh, it ever comes to a shelf, uh, depending on the category lead time. Today, the portfolio management in the company has to decide, will I buy national or multinational brands? Will I do it myself? Will I co-develop? Will I, will I source it partly? Will I have it under my brand or under a brand which is designed for me? This is the, this is the challenges that they have to face today. And, uh, and, and there's no way, even if the best uh, instinct or experience to, uh, to anticipate and to, uh, to make the right choice uh, so far ahead without uh, the centralization of the data. And, and that, that's a key element now for, for the companies is to have a, a unique master data where uh, all information, all this information from the raw material through the ingredients, through the recipe management and the packaging uh, should be accessible at one place. That's completely essential. They need to measure, they need to have dashboards which are easy to update in real time so that all the stakeholders from the supply chain can really measure their progress, but also the trends, uh, looking at the, the way they have been doing products in the past and probably define a new product from an existing one because they saw that it was uh, much better sold and appreciated by consumer from the statistics that they get out of the data. That, that will help them to do the best decisions possible uh, ahead, as we all know that uh, between the decision and the product launch there is time, and um, there is always a part of uh, prediction which needs to be done. And the more it is supported by uh, tangible data, tangible historical data, which I'm having in a centralized uh, uh, platform, uh, the more chance I have to hit the target and to be uh, on track on the, on the objective which, um, which I had. 
So that's for the impact of the brand owners. And let me let me finish with a few words uh, about about Trace One. Um, on the next slides, where the question, yes, the question could be today. Uh, um, we are we are changing. Um, are you changing? And uh, and this is exactly the question that we are we are putting when we are talking to our clients um, in general. Is that the world is changing so fast that they need to adapt, but of course they also need to anticipate. And uh, all the tools which are put in place today and which uh, we are offering, especially for the private label as a trace one company, are, are done to uh, simplify um, the, 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 the selection of the product, but also the, the, the construction of the product from the ID, from the inspiration, from the prototype up to the way it's going to be sold. And we all know that it's going to be sold through various uh, channels. So that, that's, that's our aim. And our aim is to uh, even to have brand owners uh, a little bit ahead of the trend uh, so that uh, when consumers see the new products being launched, they feel that they have been, uh, they have been heard and they have been understood and, uh, and, and, and brand owners should have the capability also to create the trend and to accelerate the trend with the consumers. So for them, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an everyday challenge. It's a, it's a necessity for them to, uh, to be uh, connected to the fields, to be connected to uh, the consumers, but also uh, to, uh, to anticipate what will happen tomorrow. Uh, and most of the time what happens tomorrow is something which already happened in the past. And that's, uh, that's a trend, that's, uh, that's the uh, context, that's sometimes political situations, and that's also a uh, general trends which uh, large countries are taking uh, to, to drive the world. On, uh, on, on, on the next slide, a few words, as I mentioned, on, on Trace One. So Trace One provides the, today the largest collaborative platform dedicated to manufacturers and retailers. And the good news is that it's for free. So Trace One Network has been launched uh, a bit more than a year, a year ago. It's a unique network of partners combined with the marketplace, which is offering a 100% digital experience. And uh, of course, this marketplace, you will have understood, is very much dedicated to, to support uh, brand owners to find much quicker uh, products to source much quicker raw materials, ingredients, and uh, and products which are fitting um, their their desire and their specifications. When a, when Walmart, when Tesco, when uh, Intermarché, I mentioned before, are, are looking to fit to what the consumers are willing, when they are putting some ambitious targets on sustainability, uh, with with this uh, marketplace, they have access to thousands of suppliers across the globe who are able to answer with the right criteria of uh, expectations of the customer. So this is already uh, uh, actively contributing to accelerate the development of our customers. Uh, today we have put uh, analytic solutions in place um, which, which help, uh, which makes information alive and that are accessible in a centralized part with the, with the master data which is gathering all this, uh, all this data. It offers ready-to-use interactive dashboards, which provides uh, an accurate indicators to measure the performance. And, uh, and that gives, of course, to all customers the capacity to, uh, again, uh, to measure, to track, to dig into the past, to dig into the, uh, what has been working very well, what has been very quick to be launched, and, and support the decisions, the coming decisions with tangible uh, data. Um, trace one, in, in, has been born in 2001. Today is a bit more than 150 employees. We have 25 nationalities. We have subsidiaries in France, UK, US, Spain, and Germany, where we have team who are taking care of the uh, countries, but of, also of the region sometimes. Some key customers, like Auchan, Carrefour, Walgreens in the US, Mark and Spencer in the UK, Monoprix, Casino, Intermarché, Marquant in Germany, or Super Value in the US. And, and important, as I said before, uh, more than 20,000 uh, suppliers uh, who, are, who are today using our, our platform. And that makes, of course, Trace One very, very unique. Um, 
this is um, the way that we would like to put uh, our architecture uh, today. Uh, we have launched Trace One Network. We have launched uh, the, the the marketplace recently. We have launched a year ago uh, an analytic uh, tool which is helping you go in that direction. And the, the big differentiator, I would say, from Trace One or the big added value is first the fact that the data are fully integrated from the uh, fr from the idea of discovering a product and the prototype up to the delivery on the way it has to be sold. That gives, of course, a lot of value to the fact that uh, we can access the data and whenever we want to modify something on the chain, we can do it without modifying everything. But last is, uh, is, is, is to say that uh, we are lucky enough to be, for more than 18 years, working in the private label segments for food, for cosmetics, for households, uh, and um, and that gives us, of course, a lot of expertise. And I keep on saying to uh, to our clients and to everyone that software is definitely not enough. And uh, and Trace One brings uh, 18 years of expertise in that particular market. We have an onboarding team in uh, in various con in all the countries to help customers onboard and use our product in the best possible way, but also train them on some market trends. For example, we have some training today which are dedicated to uh, how to save, how to optimize the packaging, how to reduce the plastic. So, which is exactly in the direction of what we've been discussing today. So we are delivering software, we are delivering consulting expertise, and of course, uh, market industry experts, which we are having in-house for, for many years today. So that was in a nutshell what uh, I wanted to, uh, to cover uh, today. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christophe. Um, looking at the time, uh, we're running out of time a little bit, but I just got one short question, maybe with a short answer. Um, so how do you think, how should the collaboration between the retailers and the manufacturers evolve them looking, uh, looking forward, going forward in the future? So I think that um, this, uh, the difference between re uh, retailer and manufacturer is just uh, uh, getting uh, less and less visible. I think that today uh, retailers, brand owners, suppliers, manufacturers, they are all a key part of the chain and uh, they have to work together. They have to be uh, close together. Again, uh, one is not going to be able to, uh, to drive the business. Um, if we have put Trace One Network in place, it's because all the sea level of our customers and also the operational people have been asking how can we better communicate, collaborate, share information, look at what we need among us in our ecosystem as uh, we are all specialized, but we are all able to sell a brand, create a brand and produce products. So I would say that the collaboration is going to be seamless. The collaboration is going to be very close and, um, and both of them uh, are going to nearly do the same job very soon. Probably both of them will have a specialty, but they will have to cover the same, uh, the same, the same steps into the, the way they will uh, produce and distribute the products. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christophe. So thank you to you, Christophe, in Paris, and thank you to Denise here in Frankfurt. Thank and you. thank you to all of you listening out there, wherever you are. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact Denise at uh, contact at retailytics.com. And of course, information on retailytics.com and trace1.com is also available. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.